Well, hi family. It's uh, it's great to have this opportunity of of just uh, sharing with you again, and we're going to be finishing our series this evening. Our series seven steps to grow as a disciple. So let's do a quick recap on where we've been. So step one, Murray taught us on know you are saved. You can't be a disciple until you have assurance of the fact that you are saved, that you really are a child of God. Then Catherine spoke to us on the Bible as daily bread. We need to be getting God's word into us on a daily basis. Peter followed up on that with step three. Pray as Jesus taught, and he used the Lord's Prayer as a framework for how Jesus teaches us to pray. And then Lynette did step four, the immediate. And all the knowledge in the world really doesn't take us any further until we put it into practice. We need to be obedient. Now, those first four steps are about us, about our personal individual life. It's about us as an individual disciple. Step five zoomed out a little bit. Step five was the importance of being part of a church family. And um, it was Rebecca that did this one for us. Um, and then last week, we, we zoomed out even further. And David did step six for us. Tell your God story. And telling your God story is part of our mission to the world. And I'm going to be, David actually alluded to the fact that the message I was going to give was kind of like a, a twin to his. And uh, the message tonight is about helping disciple others. So, that's where we're up to. Step seven, help disciple others. So um, I'm going to go into, a, into my photo album and I'm going to show you some pictures that date back to August 1987. August, September, October. Months I will remember. So I was, uh, I was in the army and I was doing boot camp. Um, I'm in the front row, front middle. Yes, that's me. Hard to believe. Um, I was 25 at the time, uh, with a bunch of other graduates, fortunately, in my particular bungalow, but you know, everyone else was 17, 18, and uh, it, I was already finding it hard to keep up. This is me, lying under my bed, preparing for inspection, and the bed had to be absolutely tabletop level. And so I was under my bed there with those pegs, those closed pegs. And what I was doing is I was propping up the mattress inside the bed frame with the, with the pegs to get it level. I didn't sleep in my bed, ever. What I did was I um, kind of had one of those closed cell mats and I had a sleeping bag and I slept on my bed which served the dual purpose of ironing my bed it was while I was sleeping on it. And then I just put those pegs in in the morning, and that was my bed. And um, yeah, this is what inspections kind of looked like. You know, we, uh, we waited for the corporal to come around and yeah, inspect our beds. I was in the Air Force, so uh, look at me, just a young lad there in the middle. You know, I'm just a little guy, aren't I? Oh, it's funny. And, uh, yep, putting on my blues for, uh, for some official function. And uh, look at us, ready to, you know, save the country from... I'm on the far right there, and uh, pretty much I was probably the most dangerous guy. I mean, look at my, look at my rifle's pointing. Yeah, I'm about to blow somebody's head off. So, yeah, we're talking about, you know, some of the best days of my life. Perhaps not. Perhaps not. So, 
what is the purpose of boot camp? What is the purpose of doing military training? To get you prepared. Yeah, to get you prepared. It's to train soldiers for their mission. Right. Ultimately, there's a mission. The mission is defending your country. It's going to war with the enemy. Um, armies have a purpose. And basic training is to train you for your purpose. And likewise, our training in righteousness that comes through living out those seven steps of discipleship, they train us for God's mission. Right? It's training for God's mission. So let's read about that now. Now, David used the version, a shortened version of this in his message. But let's just read the Great Commission from Matthew 28 again. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let me just highlight some of the words in that. Go and make disciples. That's what the Great Commission is. It's not to, as David said, stand on street corners and yell and scream at people. Um, it's to make disciples. And then look at the next line that I've highlighted in yellow there. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. How many commands did Jesus give us? Heaps. Lots. <laughs> Basically, making disciples takes time. Making disciples means there needs to be a relationship because you need time to download stuff. Um, because the gospel is a very, very big thing. We can try and we can try and condense the gospel down to like a one-liner, but honestly, the good news has got so many nuances to it and so much coloring in that we can do to it. The gospel's a very big thing. Yes? Is there a difference between the Ten Commandments, God made the Ten Commandments, and then there's Jesus' commandments? Is there a difference? There is, but we're going to have to talk about it some other time because... Yeah. Yes, yeah. but we will. Do you know there are actually more commandments in the New Testament than in the Old Testament? Yeah. Yeah. About 663 in the Old and over 800 in the New. So, all right. So, so basically what we need to do is, let's take the next step. We're supposed to go into the world and make disciples. So what is a disciple? What would you say a disciple is? Thoughts? A follower, a, a, a follower, follower of Jesus. Jesus. That's, that's a very good answer. Are we going to just rest with that? A student. A student. That's good. Yes. Imitator. An imitator. Nice. Ooh. An apprentice. An apprentice. Oh, that's very good. I'm going to share a verse with you that I think has, it's a very short little verse, but I think it has got all the important ingredients of a disciple in it. Are you ready for it? Oh, here we go. Matthew 4, verse 19. And Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Now, there's actually three elements to this. It just looks like there's two at first glance, but actually there's three. There is follow, and then some older versions say, I will make you fishes of men, right? And actually in the original Greek, the sense of I will change you, I will make you, is actually very evident in the original Greek language. But it's still here. I will show you, I will make you into a fisher of people. In other words, you're going to follow, you're going to be changed, and you're going to have a mission. And so, those three parts are all here. And all the way through the New Testament, we see all three of those things. Discipleship is about following Jesus. It's about being changed by Jesus through his Holy Spirit. And it's about 
being committed to the mission of Christ and becoming the fishers of people. So based on these three parts, here's a definition of being a disciple that I really like. A disciple is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. That's what a disciple is. And if you're not doing one of those three elements, you're not being, you're not behaving like a disciple. If this definition is a good one, then I never graduate from being a disciple. Right? Being a disciple then is a lifelong commitment. And so while I have the responsibility to disciple others, I always remain in need of being discipled myself. And you know the story of Peter and Paul in the book of Acts, is that called? Speaker. I think I'm back, right? Am I? Sorry about that. I should have noticed your concerned expression earlier. <laughs> I was like, Bruce is really putting me off. I'm trying to ignore him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what didn't you hear? I mean, this is, this is awkward. While I have the responsibility to disciple others, I remain in need of being discipled myself. Did you hear that bit? And the story of Peter and Paul in the book of Acts just really demonstrates this. You see, without really thinking it through, Peter had drifted into the pro-Jewish, pro-circumcision faction of the church. And Paul had to call him out on it. And yeah, Peter was a big deal in the church, right? I mean, if anyone didn't need to be discipled anymore, surely it was Peter. Um, but Paul is right and Peter is wrong. And Peter humbly makes the necessary course correction. You see, Peter never ran out of his need to be discipled. This is a line from the Great Commission. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. I'm actually fine. I just had... I'm going to turn the microphone off. Which turn it off? Uh, I must have turned the microphone off. <laughs> okay, so it's fine. Oh, so, it's thanks for all your concern. <laughs> <laughs> when Jesus says, when Jesus says these words from the Great Commission, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, he's talking about discipling them. That's what he's talking about. Now, when we think of discipling someone, we often think of some formal arrangement where a person doing the discipling is a kind of spiritual mentor and the person being discipled is the learner. And there's a place for that. We can accelerate the growth of young Christians by teaching them the essential building blocks of the faith early. We can create kind of a greenhouse environment for them to really develop quickly. And every Christian does benefit from instruction in the basics of the faith. And you know, the Alpha course was begun as a discipleship course to do exactly that. That's what Alpha began as, a discipleship course. But not everyone can be a teacher. Not everyone can be a formal mentor. So does that mean that discipling is only for the few gifted teachers? That's right, the answer is no. <laughs> The answer is, of course not. The Great Commission was given to everybody, and every Christian has a role in making disciples. We're not made disciples by going on a course. We are made disciples when we behave like disciples. When we are following Jesus, it's kind of a head thing. When we are being changed, when our heart is being changed, and when we are being on mission, when our hands are being put to use in the mission. Being a disciple is a head, heart, and hand thing. You know, going on a course has been valuable for me, but let me tell you what's been more valuable. Having someone say to me, let's pray about that, when I've forgotten to pray. And I kind of go, oh yeah. 
That's what Jesus wants me to do. And when someone has upset me, having someone else, someone wise, give me an alternative explanation of events that helps me believe the best about the person who upset me, so I, I'm not so upset anymore, and I kind of go, that's Jesus, right? Jesus believes the best about people. You've just helped me be more like Jesus. When someone is just so amazingly generous with their money or their time, and I recognize that they are being like Jesus, and I should do more. I should do more myself. When Lynette's troubles began some years ago, and we even wondered if she would live, a friend came over and showed compassion to me just by being with me and crying with me. And I recognized that he was being like Jesus, and I was challenged to show more compassion myself. And when people have encouraged me and said, I appreciate this about you, they've confirmed my giftings from God and helped me grow in them. And that's discipleship. All these people have helped disciple me. Is that true of your life too? Which brings me to my next point, which is that church family disciples each other. You know, there are over 50 one another passages in the New Testament, and we're going to go through each one tonight. No, we're not. <laughs> but these one another passages speak of our duty of care for each other's welfare. Let me name a few, even if I don't go through all 50. We're called to love one another. We are called to be devoted to one another. We're told to build one another up. We're told to admonish one another. What does the word admonish mean? <coughs> Correct. Correct, yeah. It's like, you're actually wrong here. You need, it. you need to get right. Right? We need to speak the truth in love. It says we need to speak to each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We need to speak scripture to each other. We need to teach one another, encourage one another, exhort one another. What does the word exhort mean? You're at, you're at the gym, and you have to do 50 push-ups, and you've got to 47, and the gym instructor's going, just three more, just three more, 48, 49, 50, yeah, you did it. That's, that's exhorting. We need to stir one, up, one another up to love and good works. We need to employ the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of one another. We need to pray for one another. We need to confess our faults to one another. Church family disciples each other. Church family disciples each other. So, I think it's all summed up in this verse from Romans 12, verse 5. So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. We belong to each other. What gives me the right to speak into your life? I hope I'm not that boring. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what gives me the right to speak into your life and you the right to speak into mine? And the answer is we are one body. If, if you're not doing well, I'm not doing well. If I'm hurting and you don't and if you don't take care of me, the whole body is going to end up lame and dysfunctional. I love those words, we belong to each other. Church is not a social club. You know, in a social club, you pay your membership fee and you get the benefits that the club offers. For example, you might belong to a tennis club. In order to play tennis and enjoy the social interaction with, the, with others who also enjoy tennis. But your tennis club doesn't expect you to grow personally and spiritually. You don't have to love them. They don't have to love you. And if you don't like it, you leave. Church is less like a social club and more like marriage. 
when we are brought together as parts of Christ's body, we come to belong to each other. We have a duty of care to each other in good times and bad. I want God's best for you. And you want God's best for me. You dream of me becoming all that God intended me to be. And I cherish that same dream for you. And when you see me acting in a way that's not Christ-like, because you love me, I hope you'll gently point it out to me. And when I'm discouraged, you'll speak courage into me. And when my spiritual life starts flagging, you'll give me a pep talk. Because unless we're open and honest and vulnerable to each other, we're just pretending. If we say we're family, but we turn away from each other, we'd be hypocrites, right? Our church constitution says the church of 1 to 6, one to six seeks to be a redemptive family. And all that really means is, is that we want everyone who's already here and those we're still going to invite to take steps closer and closer to Jesus. And that's why we make time in our service to eat together, to get to know each other, to pray together. Hi there, come on in. We are inviting each other into our hearts and lives so that we can love each other and encourage each other with the life and joy that only Jesus can bring. And that's why we have growth groups. And if you've been in a growth group, you will know the opportunity that they give us to care for each other, to learn and love God more, and to experience some mutual accountability for our personal walk with God, as well as those people God has brought into our lives that we need to be doing some outreach to. So, I'm just going to quickly fly through some principles here, some right thinking about discipling others. And, because um, God may from time to time bring all sorts of people across our paths that he invites us to be part of their spiritual journey too. So, whether the context is here, church at one to six, or whether it's your neighbor or someone at work, here are some basic principles for helping disciple someone else. And my number one point is, let love be your motivation. Let us only speak words that are beneficial and which build each other up. Ask for permission before you speak words of correction to someone. You need to be genuine. You need to be vulnerable. And most importantly, we need to be gracious. Because we want people to feel free to share with us the stuff that's difficult for them so that we, we can help them. Second principle is this. We are only fanning a flame that the Holy Spirit has already lit. It's not my job to convict people of sin. It's not my job to change them. It's not my job to turn them into something different. That's the Holy Spirit's problem. Not mine. And so... There needs to be a spark of the Spirit working in the hearts of people. We're just cooperating with the Spirit. If there's no spark of the Spirit, you're wasting your time. Um, but if there's something there, there's something to work with. And then encourage them to take the same seven steps you are taking. All right, a chocolate for the person who can actually list what the seven steps are. Sorry? Eight steps. Eight steps? Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't count the picture. What are the seven steps? What are the seven steps? Who feels like they could name them all? Uh, not all of them, but I think I can start us off. Okay. Um, know that you're saved. Know that you're saved, yeah. Pray. Pray, yeah. The Bible is God's but, word. The Bible is daily bread, yep. I belong to a local church. Belong to a local church. Tell your God story. Tell your God story. <laughs> okay, we're still missing we're still missing one from the from the pers personal set. Be obedient. Be obedient. Oh that's that's yeah. that one part. <laughs> yeah, well done. Well done. And then tonight's one. All right. I think we'll have to give um, Lindsay a chocolate for, for, for getting so so close. So you're taking those seven steps as you 
as you disciple others, you're encouraging them to take those same steps. And then we need to think rightly about discipling others because their spiritual growth is their own responsibility. It's not yours. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have been guilty of owning this person's growing spiritually and taking it very personally when things go wrong. But you're just confirming to them what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to them already. Okay, you don't have to be the change agent in their life. The Holy Spirit is going to be there. So we need to be a good question ask. ask and here's a great question that you can ask people that you're busy discipling. They, they've told you about a problem, about what they're not doing right, about a failure in their life. And you can ask them this question, what could you do about that? Isn't that a great question? Mm -hmm. Because once they've answered that question, they have taken responsibility for fixing it. And it's their responsibility, not yours. And then be a good listener. Because the better you listen, the better the questions you can ask. And, uh, and you can get to the heart of the matter. We're nearly there. Don't reduce the cost of following Jesus. You see, it's really tempting to try and make following Jesus sound not too hard or to make it easier than Jesus makes it. So there's the story in the Bible of this rich young ruler, this guy who's obeyed all the commands <coughs> and stuff, but um, you know, he wants to know what he must do to be saved. And Jesus says to him, look, sell all of your riches and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. That's all it's going to take. And the guy leaves sad because he's not about to you know cash in his his shares and bonds and bank accounts and stuff and when i read that story i, I sometimes think gosh jesus you made it so tough for him you made it so hard i mean couldn't you couldn't you have just made it just a little bit easier lowered the bar a little bit <laughs> I mean, anyone else felt like that reading that story? But here's the thing. Jesus didn't ask the rich young ruler to do anything that he hadn't already asked. Peter and James and John. He had asked them to leave everything and follow him too. Now, Peter's fishing boat was as worth as much to Peter as the rich young ruler's riches. Right? It was his whole livelihood. But he asked Peter to leave all of that behind and follow him too. So Jesus was asking no more of the rich young ruler than he asked of his fishermen and his tax collector friends. Mm -hmm. The cost of following Jesus is you've got to die to self, you've got to take up your cross, and you've got to follow, follow Jesus. That is the cost of discipleship. And we sometimes want to make it sound like it's easier at the beginning so people don't get scared off. But, but the reality is they need to know what the cost is and the Holy Spirit is convicting them of the truth of that too. Share your relationships with others. If you've got someone in your life that you're trying to lead to Jesus, um, don't do it alone. Get other relationships around you. Bring them to church. Introduce them to, to, to us. Get some help from the rest of us because the more people that are feeding into this person's life, the faster their spiritual growth is going to be. I have no idea why that's, why that's black. Maybe because I pushed, I pushed a black, didn't I? There we go. All right, there we go. Dealing with disappointment. How do you think Jesus felt about Judas? How do you think Jesus felt about Peter? And then Paul. Here's a little line. Here's a little line from Paul. This is from 2 Timothy chapter 4. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. And a little bit further on, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. 
and the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Paul is feeling a bit disappointed in people in this particular passage. And sadly, there will always be people that you invest in, people that you love and try to help, who are going to simply fade away. They're never going to live up to their full redemptive potential. Others may even turn on you and oppose your ministry. How do we deal with the stuff? Give your disappointment to God. Focus on the good stuff that's happening, right? Because there's always good stuff happening too. Remember that even for you, being a disciple is only possible through God's grace. We need to remember that. It's God's grace that's keeping us on track. And then persevere. Persevere. Carry on. And then we can always pray. Jesus says, for sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's all the work of God. We can do nothing without him. And Jesus promises to always be there for us. So let's pray often. The Bible talks about praying all the time. Let's pray for the people God has brought into our life. That he'll work out his purposes in their life. That he will give us wisdom, strength, and perseverance for the journey. Because God is good. At your tables, discuss this question. Can you think of an occasion when someone said or did just the right thing to help you grow as a Christian? All right, talk about that at your table.